Hello. <laughs> I seem to be making it on Monday evenings now, so I seem to have got my hang of um, organising StreamYard and Facebook Live together for once. Well, hopefully forever, not just for once. So, well, all sorts of things have been happening. I don't know about the rest of you, but the weather has been so windy and so wet. I mean, we've been having 40 mile an hour winds around us here and sometimes full of rain as well. So imagine 40 miles an hour of forty mile an hour of horizontal rain is, whoa, you know. So it hasn't been that much outside work, unfortunately, which is a bit of a blow because um, I'm getting to have a, a complete hay meadow out in the garden instead of several nice meadows with paths in between. But it looks like it's going to be mowable tomorrow, so I should be out there brrrr, mowing the paths. And um, I'll try and get some pictures up of it when it's done, because at the moment you can't tell one thing from the other. But the other thing about that, which has been annoying, is um, the meadows, they've really only been going since this time last year, because I had to do lots of ground preparation and things beforehand. So the basic grasses are in and things like that and the, the prairie meadow is pretty well done but the others are not so I'm getting lots and lots of plug plants that I got from over the winter and they will get to get planted in and I also seem to have um, probably almost the national collection of the small hogweed and whilst hogweed is very good for many pollinators and butterflies, um, <clears throat> one can have too much of a good thing. So I have been sort of assisting them to uh, translate to a new uh, form of existence in the compost bin where they will go around again and come out as soil. And where they come out is where the plug plants get planted. So it all works out really very well. Also got an excess of thistles. I like thistles, thistles are very good for the garden and for many plants and animals. But again, you can have too much of a good thing. So it's been a little bit of a fraught week like that. And a lot of inside work, which has actually been good in some ways. And part of me was sort of like wondering, well, I wonder what, what does other world want me to talk about as well as you guys uh, today? And what came up was, well, it was quite complicated how it came up. Things always are. Um, anyway, what came up was the crooked path. You probably heard the, the phrase, the, crook, the crooked path. <laughs> Can't talk today. The crooked path. And it gets used in novels and things like that. And it's often taken to mean the left-hand path, black magic, um, nasty business, that kind of stuff. But that isn't necessarily the case. It says the crooked path. And really, when you get right down to it, that's all it means is the crooked path, the weaving path, you know, like the wiggles of a snake or an animal path, which is definitely not straight. It might be straight through a bit, and then it goes round and round again and, and round corners and round trees and round boulders and things like that. So it's just that it's crooked and that doesn't mean to say it's bad however for a couple of thousand years <laughs> we have been very much told that the best thing is the straight and narrow we must keep to the straight and narrow mm, yeah but nature doesn't I'm trying to think, I was trying to think this morning when I was sort of jotting up a few notes for this. I was trying to think this morning, what is straight in nature, in the natural world? And I got to, well, hazel cops, um, a hazel cops, a ha coppiced hazel tree will grow very long straight poles. And so will an ash tree and sometimes so will a yew tree. Why those I'm thinking of? Because 
they all make either very good sticks, walking sticks, or bows. And you do need a straight piece of wood for that. But even so, it's only up so far. And then it branches off and twists. And it gets a lot of the branches. And it twists around that way because the sun's coming and this branch is overshadowing it and so on like that. So, yes, it does, but not for all that long. And you follow animal paths. I was following um, badger runs in the field um, on the one sort of hour of fine weather we got over the weekend, uh, nipped out for a walk. And we've, we've got badgers around here, and there's some good badger sets. It's really worth going to see and, you know, going and buying some peanuts and spreading them around and going out at dusk and watching, particularly now watching the babies because the youngsters are out and it's gorgeous. But anyway, they will make a straight track. And, right, okay, they will make a straight track. And we've got fields around us, um, field fields with grass in them for cows. And the badger will, like, come in under the gate or through a gap in the hedge. And then he'll go zoom across the field because there isn't anything in the way. But when he gets to the hedge, he turns and moves and goes through the hedge at the most convenient place at the other end. And then if, say, the next field is ploughed, which in one of the walks I take it is, it's not our farmers, it's another farmers, then he doesn't go straight. He goes along beside the furrows or maybe goes over a bit and then down a furrow and then across to go to wherever he wants to go. So... It's about, is there something in the way for Mr. Badger? And Mrs. Badger, of course, too. I was watching the birds. And they don't go straight either. They do make dives. I mean, we've got bird feeders up in the front yard. And um, one by the kitchen window, because we love to watch and see who's coming. And we've got bushes over the side. So, you, you know, you've got your bird feeder. But you've got bushes over here. And they sort of go to the bush and then they dive for some food and then they dive back to dive into it and hide in a bush again because we do have crows and we do have magpies and most of the birds are pretty canny and so they make a quick dash for some food and then a quick dash back to the bush again and the bushes are nice and thick and lots of twigs and so there's some very frustrated magpies and a crow going wah, 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 wah. you know can't get the bloody birds wah. and uh, <laughs> Yeah, so again, it's straight when it has purpose to be straight. And when it doesn't, it's not. We've got foxes come across the garden and they usually come in a bit of a weavy path. And having watched one or two, they're usually following their noses. So it's where something else is or where something else has been. There's woods around us and there's like moorland, heather paths up through the mind and things like that. There are animal paths. And the animal, say, wants to get from the stream down at the bottom of the hill up to the top of the hill. But to go straight up a hill, and they are quite vertical, some of them, like that. You've been up a hill like that. It's bloody hard work. So you tend to weave, which a lot of paths do. And they sort of go around and cross and then they come out of it that way and then they go out of it that way because there's a rock or because the, the walking is a little bit easier there or whatever. So the animal is adapting to the land under its feet to see, is this how I do it? You know, is this the easiest way? Is this the way that's going to use as little energy as possible so that I don't, you know, what I get to eat will actually keep me going? Because animals know very well that food is fuel and that they must have enough to eat or they can't. They just can't get to where they want to be. So there's all this stuff about what is needed. And nature behaves in a line with what is needed and what's the creature needs or the bird needs and what the land is offering 
and is able to give at that point. I mean, if you've got a blooming great oak tree stuck in your way, you go around it, you know, unless you're a lunatic, you don't try and go through it. So the path weaves around. And then you might find there's a bit of better footpath there. So you carry on going down that bit. Haven't you done this when you go for a walk in a wood or even in a field or, you know, the edge of a wood? Animals naturally do this, but then they're really in tune. The straight stuff, I had a little think about what have we got that's straight. Well, roads, I mean, American motorways, so having been on them, it's like, oh, straight on forever. And then I can't remember the thing in straight on to morning, isn't it? Uh, Yellow Brick Road and, and all that stuff. And they just go straight across everything. And particularly in the, in the central belt where there's, it's mostly plains, it's not too difficult. And the, the hills sort of rise up a bit and then they go down a bit. They're not, they're not like a lot of ours, which are like this, you know, hoop, down, hoop, down. <laughs> at least not in the central belt. And then we get the thing, and then this happened, and it's very much, my, my husband's a bit of a machinist type brain, and he likes mechanics and engineering and this sort of thing, which is sort of all very well, but anyway, he, he gets these programs on railways and this amazing tunnel that they dug through 10 miles of mountain, which in some countries they certainly have done that long. So there's a mountain in the way of where you want to put your railway or your road. If you make a hole through the mountain. No other animal does this. And wait, 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 wait on this one. Let's think about this. Why do we do it? Why do we do it? Hi, Karen. Um, we do it usually for money because we need to get our sheep wool, our potatoes, our whatever it was, to market before the other bloke, so that we can score, score a few bucks or whatever on over it. And we do the same sorts of things, for instance, with rivers. And I mean, surely you must have heard about this kind of thing, you know, they, they were thinking about straightening and they have tried to straighten bits of the Mississippi. It's an enormous, I've, I've been to it, I've been across it. It's enormous, it's enormously wide. And like rivers, it goes the way of the land, like this, the crooked path. So they tried to make it straight, mostly because they wanted to get ships up and down it, paddle steamers and ships and trade and all this kind of thing. And so let's straighten it out so they haven't got so many corners to go around and we'll make it all the same depth all the way through so that it doesn't wander about and it's dead easy for any lunatic to drive his boat up it. And what's happened? Floods. Massive floods. We've done the same in India. We've done the same in this country. They've done the same in places in Europe and Asia. And I not sure they've actually done it in Australia, so good on you if you haven't Australia. <laughs> um, or Africa, I think, or probably South America, because it's very hard work to do there. Um, but anyway, the places you haven't done it, good on you. Don't, don't even start, please. Floods. And one of the things that happens when floods happen is all the soil gets washed away. So there's nothing for anything to grow in. And never mind our farming, there's nothing for trees and bushes and herbs and grass for the animals to eat, for it to grow in, or for them to nest in, or for them to shelter in, or for them to lay their eggs in. And when the floods get really bad, and, and some of the Italian ones have shown this, um, trees are uprooted. Well, I mean, the Boss Castle flood did when it just came down the river valley like that. I mean, it picked up cars and trucks and trees and everything and just heaves the lot down. Water's incredibly powerful when it gets going. So is this a good idea? And then where I last lived, they drained the land 
to try and stop it getting flooded and because they wanted to use it for growing corn for animals on actually um, and it would become valuable land it, it would be improved uh, by being drained and all the rest of it and it didn't he had to work so hard to get that land to grow his corn whereas if he'd left it alone to grow what it wanted to do and to be a floodplain which is what it was the floods that happened all around us wouldn't have happened as we used to go out through you know yay much water sometimes if it had been raining in the lane so we do all this kind of thing so is this straight and narrow such a good idea seems like it's not is the crooked path a good idea well judging by the way animals and rivers and all sorts of things use them i'd say yes it probably is in fact i go more than that i'd say yes it definitely is useful right okay so we've got the crooked path and it's there weaving and wandering its way through the land and it takes us places now, I'm sure most of you have been out on the moors or out in the forests and the woods and, you know, in a sort of semi-wild place. And you followed animal tracks sometimes. I mean, children love to do that. And us older kids love to do that when we still can too. And so you follow them along. And then the path sort of veers off there. It sort of wobbled its way fairly straight so far through the wood and then it veers off there and you look up and there's this bloody great willow tree in the middle say or a beech tree or a chestnut or something in the middle of course it's going around that way so it goes there again until it meets something and the deer or the badger or the fox or whoever goes around things now, water goes around things too. You watch a river and it does meander and it wanders its way down, particularly in the flatlands. It goes down the easiest way when it's in rocky, hilly country and it goes down the easiest way it can get. Water always goes the easiest way, the easiest way to down, because it really does work with gravity very well. And there's a big rock in the way, something left over from the Ice Age, you know, rumbled down the hill. There's a bloody great thing about half the size of a house. And the water doesn't go through it, it goes round it. Yeah, being very powerful, water, as it goes round over hundreds of years, will carve out a path for itself, leaving bits of the rock up there and its own path going under the rock as well. It does that within the ground too. But it goes round, it finds the easiest path. Air does that too. The wind blows, but if something's in the way, it goes round it. Okay, if it's a tornado, it picks it up. That's an extreme, like a flood. But in the ordinary way, the wind, even our 40 mile an hour winds the other, the other day, in fact yesterday, they went round things. And it's quite interesting because it, it was coming like towards the house this way and then there's the house. So it would veer off that way. So you've got the wind coming that way and then you've got the wind coming down this way, down this path. And then it shot off that way again. So it was doing a zigzag in order to get through the gaps where there wasn't great lumps of matter. House in this case. But it had to go through. You watch it with the trees. We've got a lot of oak trees and some chestnuts, and they're big. They're old ones. They're veterans, a lot of them. And the top bit is all going like hell. Yeah. But the trunk, yes, it is moving, but the air is split around it, or the air goes mostly one way around it. So air goes that way too. Strangely enough, even fire 
picks the easiest way. It picks the easiest things to burn, burns them first. If you look at your wood fire, if you've got a damp piece of wood and several dry pieces, the fire whips around the damp bit, which is sort of stuck right in its way, but it whips around the edge of that, burns the dry bit, and hopefully is drying up the damp bit as well. And if it's got any energy left by the time it's got to the end of your fire, it then has a go at the damp bit. But again, it goes the easiest way. It doesn't waste energy. It uses the energy it has, but it doesn't waste it. So what's this got to do with the crooked path in magic? Well, I suspect some of you have got the idea already. We can try and do the straight and narrow and climb the ladder and, you know, become a, a super duper whiz bang wizard or maestro something or another like that. But the best of those, the path there is always winding. I'm going to give you a little phrase now, which is one of my favorite in the whole universe. Um, from a lady called Ursula K. Le Guin, whose books I like. And she said in a lovely novel called Left Hand of Darkness, she gets one of the characters, characters to say, it's good to have an end to journey to, but it's the journey that matters in the end. I'll say that again. It's good to have an end to journey to, but it's the journey that matters in the end. Now, Talking about the crooked path, think about that. Because if it's straight and narrow, like you're whizzing up the motorway, when you're whizzing up the motorway, what do you actually see? Not a lot, really, do you? I mean, you may do, but A, you're probably going a hell of a lick, like 70 miles an hour, or more if you're wicked. Um, but we won't talk about that. And Anyway, if you're the driver, you're concentrating on the three lanes of traffic and who's coming up behind you and did you want to get out now to pass this lorry and all this stuff. So not really looking at anything except driving, at least if you're going to be safe, you really didn't ought to be. And the edges of motorways, sometimes they're nice, but quite often they're not. Quite often they're really boring. Um, and it may be sort of acres and acres and acres of this farmer's corn or potatoes or even just plain green desert of grass. Sometimes you'll get some good stuff, but very often you won't. So you're whizzing along and your aim is to get from Shrewsbury, near where I live, to Birmingham. Right. So you don't really care about what's in the middle. You're just interested in Birmingham. And getting there as fast as you can. So that is quite the opposite of what Ursula Le Guin said, isn't it? She said, it's good to have an end to journey to, like getting to Birmingham. But it's the journey that matters in the end. So it's how did you spend that time getting from Shrewsbury to Birmingham? Did you spend it in a sort of days of nothingness? Or did you actually know where you went? Oh, I didn't see that last time I came along here. Yeah, oh gosh, oh, that was, yeah, that was really interesting. Or, wow, there's a whole flock of red kites above me now, yeah. or whatever. In which case, your journey had importance. And the hour or two hours or however long it was you spent on the journey wasn't a journey of nothingness. It was a journey of noticing, of being, of looking. And all of that, noticing and looking and being, all of that is acknowledging the other. It's acknowledging the trees. It's acknowledging those red kites. It's acknowledging that lovely cloud over a hill. Which if you're going along at 70 miles an hour, you won't be. So you've just ignored everything you've whizzed past. How would you feel? You're sat in the cafe and you know me quite well, say. And I come hurtling through and just sort of go, ah, Ellen. And I zip, zip out again. And you go, huh? Wow. 
What was up with her then? Just possibly the natural world and certainly other world. They go, what was up with her then? What was that about? You know, that's the third time this week she's done this to me. You know, doesn't she like me anymore? Have, have I done something to offend her? What's going on? How we would feel with people that we know, even if we only know them slightly. So think about that. Other world are going to know the same thing. And if you ignore them on your journey, then they're going to go, well, help with her then. A thought. Whereas if you were travelling on this crooked path that I was talking about, you would have time to see and notice and stop and think. And that, that is like following, that is, it's not like, that is following the deer traps. Because you're following the path, but it isn't with a determination to, you know, I'm going to be enlightened by midsummer. God help us all. Um, or I'm going to finish this course by the end of July. It's like, I'm going to do this course and I'm really going to get the most out of it. I'm going to get everything I possibly can. I'm going to give it all of myself and I'm going to take in everything that it gives to me. And that requires this crooked path weaving between you and the path, you and the deer trots. There's a set of things really that I find very useful to remember when you're going to do this kind of work and when you're getting on this path. And they all started with my dad. Now, you hear me mention my dad a lot, not my mum. My mum died when I was three, three and a bit actually. And poor mum had cervical cancer back in the 50s and there wasn't anything you could do. There was very little, very hard in those days to tell. For quite a long time, like I think about 18 months, mum thought she just had a stomach pain and wasn't eating properly. And then they diagnosed it and it was far too late to do anything. It was far too late even for surgery, although they would have tried surgery in those days. But they didn't have things like the radiotherapy that we have now or even the chemotherapies that we have now. So poor mum died. Well, not poor mum. It was her path. And yes, I know her again now. I didn't know her when I was a little kid. So dad brought me up. And which is why dad is sort of quite important because he was both of them. He had to be for, for quite a few years. Well, about four, five years until he married my stepmother. And then she took on some of the other role. So he didn't waste his time and he spent his time with me with encouraging me to really get into both the natural world and the magic world. I was never turned off from it because he'd been following the path all his life and his people behind la 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 and all mum's people were as well. So I wasn't ever told, oh, it's time we gave up having an imaginary friend and it wasn't called an imaginary friend anyway. So which fairy was that you were talking to today? Um, and I was supposed to know, or how did you get on with your friend the sheep? I had a friend the sheep um, and we used to talk to each other through the hedge. So I wasn't put off any of that kind of stuff. But like all kids, I ask questions. I mean, I imagine I must have been a right pain in the arse um because i was an only child so you know the times when i was with dad there wasn't any unlikely to be any other kids around so it was asked dad and even if there were it's let's go and ask my dad then so <laughs> poor dad was like what now <laughs> he did look like that sometimes but he he would never turn me away not unless it was really important and then he would explain that it was important and that he would be there in an hour or whatever Anyway, so I'd ask the question, and most of the time his answers began with, that depends. 
you know, sort of saying, Dad, why is the cat black? And sort of, well, is he all black? And anyway, that depends, doesn't it? It depends on the light you're seeing him in. Because you remember when you sat beside the fire with him last night, he looked quite red. And then, you know, in the sunlight, first thing this morning, he looked quite black. So it all depends what kind of, what, what the light's like, for instance. And so everything I, I got to understand, I got to understand without knowing I was understanding it, that everything is connected to other, other things. Like the cat was black in, say, the bright morning light, but had got quite a red glow in front of the fire last night. And so the colour of the cat depended on the light. Now, I couldn't have said it like that, uh, three to four to five, whatever. But it was there, implanted in me. So I got to think that I needed to look at everything. So I, mean, I was fascinated by ants for quite a while. And um, I was told, don't hurt them. You leave them alone, they've got a job to do. And then the job was explained to me gradually. And But it was like, you watch them. Now, what are they all doing? There's a whole row of them going that way, isn't there? You have a look at that. And then, look, those two are going off there. And after Dad had done it with me a couple of times, I was quite happy to go and do it myself. And then I would come back and bore him to tears by telling him what the ants had been doing. But he was very good about it, and he always listened, and he always asked the right sort of questions back to me. And, of course, I started, and he said, well, what were the ants taking those leaves for? Well, I don't know. What were they doing it for? Well, what do you think? That depends. I mean, were they eating them? Or was it for a nest or whatever? So I was given like lots of connections, lots of possible things that could be actually happening. And a simple little thing, even like playing with the ants, it makes connections. Even in a three or four or five year old brain, it makes those connections. They may not have the vocabulary to do it even half as well as I'm doing it now, which isn't that brilliant, but there you go. Um, but it makes the connections. And when I'd made some of the connections, dad would take the time out to sit with me and we'd talk about it. And I'd ask questions and he'd give me examples of, well, you know, in Africa, there are termite things and they build these enormous sort of pointy houses like that. Um, he'd get the paper out and he'd draw me a squiggly pointy house with a termite. God knows what it actually looked like a termite, but, you know, it was fine at the time. And explain about how they worked and all this sort of thing. Or he'd explain about what the cat was doing at a particular time or anything like this. And he made the connections through the tellings. And these tellings of what was going on, what was happening, because he was a Kavaris, a storyteller. So the tellings would turn out storified as well. Um, they would get more elaborate as I grew up, of course, and help me to make yet more connections. Now, the point of that, well, great idea always a good thing to do with people adults tend to get more pissed off about that depends than young kids do as long as you keep the that depends going on a story term adults tend to want it to be simple and black is white and i don't need to think about it anymore but kids actually often quite like thinking so that's really good anyway it took me up into a way of like when I'm going for a walk of looking and noticing and then gradually I started to take that into problems that happen in life that are not like going for a walk they're like like say at school problem with a math problem or a geography problem or something like that what is that I don't understand that and teachers weren't always very good in those days, so you couldn't ask them, so you bring it home. And I'd mull over it, I'd mull through it. And 
what would happen is I come up against the thing that I couldn't understand and I stop. Now, that's really stop because quite often when we come up against something we don't understand, our brain sort of panics and starts firing off in every direction and, and thinking up totally incredible ideas that could or might or possibly may be true or may not, whatever. But it doesn't stop still. And there used to be an old phrase, I think even from the First World War, so right or wrong, stand still. And I got that one quite a bit. And it's very good because if you actually stop and stand still, everything gets out of your face a bit. And you're still alive and you haven't solved the problem, but you're still alive and the sun's still shining. You're breathing. So you calm down, you cool it, you chill. And as you do that, so things get more in perspective and you start to see connections. And so you might work out what this math problem was or start to get a beginning of a hand and try something out. Oh, that didn't work. I'll stop again. When, you get, when I'm really stuck, say, with a math problem, I'd take it to dad, obviously. But it was all like, have a go first and see if you can work out the connection. And part of that came because dad, from a kitty, when we went for a walk, he'd teach me to stalk, to be able to get up really close, say, to a rabbit or a hare or a deer without them running away. And there's a skill in that, as, as any wildlife photographer will tell you. There's a skill in being able to be still and be still inside and not panicking, because animals sense your, pan your panic and your fear immediately as well as smell it. And just there, 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 walk. And there you are, and you're three feet from the hair, which I have been. And that's about the stopping and not panicking and being still. Now, when you come up against something like that on the magic path, as say on the math path, but particularly with the magic path, you stop and you can ask for whatever it is you come up against, the problem. You can actually talk with that problem. Why? Why is the, the house move not going through? It's all sort of there, but it's not happening. There seems to be a block. What's going on? And then you're still. And ideas trip on. Something will go boing at you. And you say, follow that up. And it'll probably get to, very quickly, get to a place where you say, what am I doing or not doing that is actually getting in the way of getting this house move working. And it will come to you. Other world will be able to show you because you're not in a tizzy. And you'll go, oh, right, I see. And this happened to me when we were coming here. And um, there are a couple of things that I hadn't thought about doing. Um, in personal relationships and I did them and whew, we were here and it was only because I stopped and sat back and said what's going on what am I doing or what am I not doing because it can be either that is getting in the way and I accepted that I was probably doing something that got in the way not that somebody else was I would have been told if there was, and I was told when there was. Um, but, you know, your first thing is, what can I deal with? I can actually change myself. I can actually change what I do. Changing somebody else is very, very, very hard. <laughs> Probably impossible a lot of the time. But certainly changing yourself. And changing yourself puts a different perspective on. So you're not looking there, you're looking there. And everybody else is then not looking there, but looking there. And so 
the whole world changes around you as you change yourself. Now, sometimes, and it certainly happened with this thing with move to live here, is I didn't understand at first. Now, when I'm listening for an answer, I keep very still. And I do my damnedest to shut my head up and stop it going, Bleh! as heads do. And I just try and keep very still. Breathe, breathe, a sun, and just listen, listen, watch. I mean, listen with all your senses. I mean, you can feel, listen, and see, listen, as well as hear, listen, and listen. And if you didn't quite catch it, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could you run that past me one more time? Ah, uh, I didn't understand that bit. Can you show me that in a different way so you ask supplementaries if you say can you show me that in a different way that really helps it's a question that anybody can probably have a go at answering and it's not threatening and you haven't said i don't understand what you mean as it's their fault um <laughs> tends to put people's backs up um, but can you show me i didn't get that can you show me that in a different way most people can handle it and can do that. Other world certainly can, and they will. So reasonably quickly, you get the idea. And you see that actually you thought you were going like that, and actually you've got to do that, and then that, and then that, and then you're back on path. So again, it wasn't straight. There were various things that had to be done before you could get to the place you were going. This is this crooked path again, and not trying to <laughs> make things simple, not trying to cut down things and save time and whiz to Birmingham at 900 miles an hour or whatever it was. You don't need to do that. What you do is you need to get to Birmingham at the right time. So you need to get to moved into your new house like we did here at the right time. With that, I could not, well, I did ask for it, and I, it could not have been better. Um, I wanted it. I wanted to be able to move in here as my birthday present. And I said, what I would really, really, really like is to wake up on my birthday morning in my bed in the new house. And I did, because we moved the day before. And so that night I went to bed. And the morning I woke up and the sun was shining, special effects team were out. And I was there in my new house, in bed, waking up for the sun. And it was one hell of a crooked path getting there. But I followed it and I kept walking and I kept going and I kept asking. And this is the point of the crooked path. This is the journey that matters. As Ursula Le Guin said, it's good to have an end to journey to, but it's the journey that matters in the end. And this was the journey that mattered. And without that journey, I wouldn't have all the loveliness that I have around me here now. Because I wouldn't have been that person. All these things, these hang-ups and moving around that path and having to sit beside this until the flood goes down and whatever. All these things that get in your way actually have lessons to teach you. And this is what the crooked path is about. They have lessons. And if you don't pause with them, work with them, you won't get there. You'll get somewhere, but you won't get to the end that you were actually hoping for. You have to go through the whole thing step by step. Well, it took me somewhere else, all this stuff. <laughs> and I was not expecting this for one moment at all, but I got it. And it was rather fun. Um, I've followed all sorts of things, done all sorts of things, had friends of all sorts of traditions. And one that 
resonated with me a lot and still does, although nothing like it used to for the time when I was really following it strongly, was Zen, Zen Buddhism. And one of the things, or one of the stories which resonated so strongly with me and it made such sense to me is the 10 ox herding pictures that they're in a temple in Kyoto if you ever want to go and see the, the real thing. But you can buy books of them and pictures and you can Google all the pictures. So I was there thinking of this. And I was thinking of the crooked path and thinking about the end and about not knowing where the path was going. And the fact that when you set off, you actually don't know the path at all. And even if you've driven that road to Birmingham loads and loads of times, it won't be the same today as it was last week. And it won't be next week either. It will be different. And so every time you are walking, driving, riding, journeying, you are journeying a new path every time you do it. And so that's the important thing about taking the curves and going gently and stopping where you get an obstruction and learning all the way through because every time it will be different. Now in the ox herding pictures up to number seven he's found his ox and work, learned to work with it a bit and then he's able to get home and the ox actually carries him home. And so number seven let's get the picture up for you let's see if I can do this blooming screen sharing thing for you again which we will have a little go at and see what it comes up yeah, I want a window darling I don't want the whole blooming jolly boiling let's have a go here it comes there now that's picture number seven and it's always one of my favorites when I first discovered it because he's got home with the ox and the ox is resting and he's resting and I'll read you the actual words in the thing from you, from it, which is really good. So where's it gone? There it is. The words that come with the painting are, astride the ox, I reach home. I am serene. The ox too can rest. The dawn has come. In blissful repose within my thatch dwelling, I've abandoned the whip and the ropes, which he'd used to catch and tra chain, <laughs> catch and tame the ox, which I'm not very keen on, but you know, he's there, he's given it all up. And he's looking, he's there looking at this beautiful mountain. Yeah? Now he's in the Japanese, the Eastern position of gratitude. And he looks at the mountain, and above it the sun is rising, the dawn has come. Between him and the mountain is a valley, but it's full of mist. Do you see there's all these clouds? And it's mist. He can't see. He can see here, and he can see there. But he can't see the way between. He has no idea when he steps off this cliff that he's his house is on and goes on to the path to go to the mountain. He has no idea what the path is going to be like. There's some vague bits of possible something or another down here. But he has no real idea what it is. And that's a really important part of the crooked path too. That we can go without knowing what the way is going to be like, how it's going to be that we haven't got to have a complete insurance policy to carry us through it and the whole thing project manage inch by inch. We can actually just go. And in magical work, and particularly in following the crooked path, in following the deer trots, which is what it is, you need to be able to just go. It takes practice to do that. It's practice as he will find in the morning when he gets up to go. To just go. And to trust in that way. It's a form of trust, 
and it's a very useful sort of form of trust. So we give thanks for the homecoming and we look out towards the dawn and the mountain, our next destination, our next end to journey to. And between ourselves and the mountain, the mist-shrouded valley, we can't see the path. We can't see what it, where it will go, and the path that will lead us down and up again to the mountain. And we'll begin tomorrow, not knowing. We'll begin tomorrow, stepping each step. And only in the stepping will we know where we are at that moment. And we still won't know where we're what the path will be in front of us. We still won't see it. We just trust each step. For me, following the deer trots and Zen have many similarities. I found this out when I was learning with my Zen friends. And I like it. There's lots of wriggling and laughter and this I don't have to know feeling. Now, since then, I found that I don't need to know this. I just need to do it. I found that in so many other places too, not just in Zen and not just in the deer trots, the crooked path. I'll stop that sharing now. So following the deer trods is a crooked path. It will take you through all sorts of strangenesses, places you didn't even know existed and even think about before. And as long as you follow step by step, stopping, asking, listening, learning along the way and being frustrated and having the occasional tantrum too, because we all need to do that, but keep on going following the path. The journey matters. It really, really does. And next time, which is a follow on from this, I hope I'm going to have something else to tell you, which is something that you can do and um, join and learn more about this path yourself. So I'm going to finish there now. And Tara Karen, see you again, and everybody else. And I'm off to have a cup of tea, and I will see you again next week, same time, same place. And no, I haven't got any red carnations, but I'll see you next week. Bye for now.